The four hidden dynasties. First of all, what does horn symbolize in our Father's Word? Horn symbolizes, especially in the Old Testament, power. Just almost related to the word dunamis, dynamite. Just really um, means power that is, uh, that overcomes. There were even horns situated on each corner of the altar, which meant the power of God. Now, why then are horns utilized to exercise or express, rather better said, power? Because they're external. God never hides anything from those that have eyes to see. I mean, you can see the horns. It's not like a kidney or something that's all tucked away out of sight that, you know, you'd have to have x-ray vision to observe. He lets it ha be right out in the open. So, therefore, we have horns symbolizing power. Well, now, that's wonderful, but you must always remember in this world there are two powers. There is the power of our Father, and there is the power of the enemy. That is to say, the amount of power that God allows him to exercise. How's he doing with you? Are you allowing him? Don't. Put a stop to it. I always like in teaching to begin with the positive side. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. We have a horn that is with us always. And we read of that horn in uh, Luke chapter 1. Let's begin with verse 68. Verse 68 reads, and this has to do with our Messiah. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Now, that's for you today. It, I mean, it's in effect today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. It's there. You're redeemed at any time you choose to be. It's, you make the decision. 69. And hath raised up an horn, power, external, you can see it if you have eyes to see. Otherwise, you're blind spiritually. It's external whereby you can witness it. The horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. In other words, the true Messiah came through the genealogy or the genes of David. Out of Jesse shall a root come, and Jesse being David's father. And... That was so you would have the key of David, whereby you would not be confused about the true Messiah. So that external horn of salvation being where you can see it, if you have eyes to see, if you want it. You might think of it in a spiritual sense as the horn of plenty or the horn of life. All of life spills forth from that. That is to say, good quality life. It's like the tree of life from that horn that is our Savior. He saves you from everything you want Him to, basically, except what you need for a little fine honing to make a strong person out of you as a servant of God. He doesn't like hothouse lilies that wilt when the first hot temperature comes along, but He likes lilies that can withstand of the valley that can withstand the conditions and the element whereby he places you. Can you cut it? Of course you can. No problem. Verse 70, and he spake by the mouth of his prophets. That's why you love this word. Which have been since the world began. That means ages ago. From the very beginning, in the first earth age. God doesn't keep secrets. He leaves it out external. Whereby if you taste of it, you experience it, and you know that that power is ever-present in your life. 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. 
Absorb that. Let it flow through your mind. All your enemies that hate you. He handled, all right? Over the period of time, it all comes out. 72, to perform mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. That's his contract. He's going to keep it. He's not going to forget. He keeps that covenant. He keeps that contract at all costs. Why? That's his covenant and contract with you whereby you know he will never leave you nor will he forsake you. The covenant that uh, in 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. What does Abraham mean in the Hebrew tongue? The father of all nations or many nations. Why? Because that covenant applied to whomsoever will partake of the horn of salvation but does not release anyone from the covenant made with Israel that you're supposed to fulfill that that is according to your people's 74. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Without fear. Did you hear that? Are you afraid? Then you better double, do some double checking. You're minus something somewhere. God will protect you as long as you use common sense. There are no giants in the world anymore. We are the giants. Why? Because we march with him. He's in control. He has the power. And you want to be very careful when you say, I'm just afraid so-and-so's going to happen. Well, you poor, miserable little soul. And maybe God intends it for it to happen for you if it should. What do you be shaking for? You can cut it. You can handle it. It's nothing to you. Take on a little demonic exercise before breakfast every morning. Works up an appetite. Good for you. Why? Because if you believe, you know that you have the victory. You don't have to fear anything as long as you utilize common sense and the wisdom that God gives you. In other words, did God say you can play with snakes and they won't bother you? No, he didn't say that. There's an idiom that said you could pick up serpents and they wouldn't bite you, but that means your reputation is too good for anybody, to, for Satan to make any headway with you. It's a figure of speech, not from Satan, not some snake. So when you use common sense, now, well, what if you went out and picked a snake up? That sucker's going to bite you if he gets a chance, I promise you. That's not using common sense. Okay, enough said. You have the victory when you think. God gave you a beautiful mind. Use it. And don't be afraid. Exercise the power that you have over the enemy through Christ. Verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Well, I sure had a bad day yesterday. Oh, you did. Well, I feel sorry for you. You poor, miserable wretch that you don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. You know, when, it, when you feel raindrops start falling, time to go. You know, get in the house or you're going to get wet. You serve God, he'll serve you. You be stupid. He'll let you be stupid. All right, it's up to you. God hates lazy people. He really dislikes them, and he's going to make you miserable, and don't ever forget that either. Nobody can help you. You've got to listen to him, believe him. Don't be lazy in faith. Let your faith be strong and secure. Every day, that didn't mean every other day, or just on your good days or your bad days. Every day he is with you. Exercise your authority. 76. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, this, of course, being Messiah. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord, John, I should say, 
to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. By what? Now, that, see, that was a condition. Many people say, oh, I don't want to claim that. Not without remission, you don't. Just hold on a minute. Not without remission. You hang on to those sins and you're guilty. Stamped. You think God doesn't see it? Big stamp on that soul. Guilty, leave them alone. Let them suffer. Guilty. So repent. Cleanse your heart and your soul. And partake of that external horn that anyone can see unless they're spiritually blind and have the faith to hang on to it. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring of on, from on high hath visited us, the branch. You know, I love this because it's like you were walking in the forest and you come up on a trickling, joyful little sound of a branch trickling from spring water. The freshness, the crispness of nature itself as God created. And he would utilize this to let you see the Savior as he is personal to you, to you alone, when you're alone, to touch you, to raise you, to use you, to where God would say, there's my child. Just like he said about Job, Satan, what do you think about that? And ain't it a dandy? Satan said, you pull away from him, I'll have him. He didn't. Why? Job was strong. Job was successful because he never gave up. Hell, if I kept going, I could make a whole sermon just out of the good horn, and I haven't even touched the four. We got four of them. The bad, we better get to it, I guess. Zechariah, Minor Prophets, next to the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 1 also. Zechariah chapter 1. This is prophecy concerning the end times. There have been four spa angels from heaven pictured upon horses scouting out the earth to see if it's time for the end yet. That is to say, time for Christ to return. And they report what they see. And then God gives some prophecies we're going to begin with verse 18 of chapter 1, which has to do with the dynasties. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and I saw, and behold, four horns. Now these are external enemies. They're what I call the four hidden dynasties. They are the four things that Satan will use against you in your life. Can you cut it, or are you a failure? Okay? I don't know. You know, I don't, and it's your business, it's not mine. External meaning what? Horns of all the things you can see on sheep, goats, cattle, or anything, they're external. You can see them if you'll look, if you'll think, if you'll use your mind. Verse 19, And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? What, what are they? What do they stand for? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered. They did what? They scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Each of these is prefixed with eth, which is to say uh, for emphasis to show that you would not confuse them with the church or Gentile or anything else. Each of them has its own article, so to speak, for emphasis so that he's saying, the tribe of Judah, the house of Israel, and Jerusalem, which you're always to look to to discern prophecy. You know, that's, that's the, the geographical location, its times and its seasons that you go by. Verse 20, and the Lord showed me four carpenters. What are these? These also are smiths in the Hebrew tongue. They're divine agencies to overthrow. Overthrow what? Those horns, the enemy. 
21, then said I, what come these to do? What are those four enemy horns supposed to do anyway? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the, the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. In other words, any power that comes up to scatter. Now, what are these horns? What are these powers? The four methods of operation which Satan utilizes are political, educational, uh, the economy, and last but certainly not least, religion. Now, if he can take over those things and have your children for a few years, he's got them just about if you haven't been working. In other words, with those things, you can brain mindset. Let me use that term. You can mindset whoever is studying that that does not think for themselves or at least come out occasionally for a good breath of air and get into God's Word to see what's actually going to happen. You listen to man and his traditions, I don't care what religion it is, this man or any other man, without checking with God's Word, and I'm going to tell you something. You're not very smart. You don't think for yourself. You think for what some organization says, whether it be this one or some other. You get back to God's Word alone and by yourself. If you can read, if you can think for yourself, and if you can't, I feel sorry for you. So, what do we take first then? Well, let's just look at some of these simpler examples of how Satan, let's go to the old boy that would call himself the king of Babylon, okay? Because he was a type, if you would, of the king of Babylon that would be in Revelation. I don't know, have you ever read Revelation, or does your church tell you you don't need to? Certainly this one does. Don't ever think man can outsmart God. Or you're stupid coming out the gate. God wrote this entire book of instructions to you for you to absorb whereby this man or any other man could not deceive you. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, what, now let me ask you a question. Do you know what Nebo means? Really, you should, if you're biblically, unless you're biblically illiterate. Nebo means the god of learning, especially letters. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar comes from. Boy, he believed in education. Trust me, he did. He liked to educate. Why? Through education, you can mindset people or set the minds of people. There's another term called brainwashing, if you so choose. Hopefully not everyone is that devious. But Satan's going to work where he can. <coughs> For example, excuse me. Why not take education itself and let a few bleeding hearts come up and say, please, that offends me. It offends me for you to say, I love the Lord. So don't say that in front of me. And bleeding heart Christians say, oh, dear God, we have offended them. Well, in that case, be wiser than the serpent and pray to yourself. God can hear you. They can't. Don't let a few uh, goy who practice other religions, and I say that not to offend, but other than Christianity, but I got some bad news for you if you don't know the difference. There's some people that worship other religions other than Christianity, and that's fine. That's their choice. And in this great nation, many of us have even fought, and some of them, such as your truly, has even shed blood to give them and guarantee them the right to believe whatever they choose, and that's fine. But don't let them prevent you from learning from your Father's Word and studying as you should, all right? Just a little word to the wise is sufficient. Now, 
Turn with me to the book of Daniel. One of the better prophets. It's an overlay to the book of Revelation as to how it would be in the end. Have you ever read it? Are you familiar with it? Have you been taught it? Concentrating on education. Again, remembering the very prime root of Nebuchadnezzar's name, the king of Babylon who was a type of the king of Babylon of the end times, Nebo, the god of learning. Uh, let's pick it up with verse 3, just to make our point. Chapter 1, verse 3. You all are learned, aren't you? You need to know what chapter. That's really a good sign. <laughs> Chapter 1, the great book of Daniel, verse 3. And the king spake unto Aspenaz. Now, Aspenaz is a good um, Babylonian name, and it probably is a descriptive name, and it means horse nose. Now, why would you call somebody horse nose? I don't know, but why is, you know, you kind of figure it out for yourself, don't you? Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. He said, I, I want sharp people. Why? Nebuchadnezzar was really, do you know that he had one of the largest libraries that have ever been found from ancient times, the tiles? He was all for education, giving you a type. For children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom. They were sharp and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. When one understands science, as many would like to tell you, there's a conflict between God's word and science. They're lying to you. There is no conflict. This earth is millions of years old in the manuscripts that this King James comes from, and the King James itself declares it, if you've read it. If you haven't, hey, tough luck. Understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. In other words, we want someone we won't have to explain away that have a right to stand there, and whom they might teach. I want to repeat that again. As it is written in 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 10, verse 10, these things happened as an ensample whereby you would know what would befall you in the end times. Okay? That they might teach and the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Okay? In other words, the idea that we're going to teach them our way. There were five dialects of the Chaldee tongue. Okay? So it took a little time. Much of Daniel is written in the Chaldee. I don't know. Have you read it? In chapter 2, verse 2, halfway through that scripture, it tur the language turns to Chaldee or Syriac or Aramaic, whichever you choose to call it. And it stays in that language until chapter 8, whereby the freedom from the Chaldees takes place, and then it goes back to pure Hebrew. Wanted to teach them. What was his request then? Okay, verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. How long? Well, three years will do it. A good course in Western civilization, you know, if, if you drag it out, so, you know, if they flunk it the first year and finally, you know, two or three more and you can get there. At, that at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. In other words, when they get sharp enough, they can come in and stand before the king. So this is the way Satan likes to operate. It's through education. It sounds so intelligent, you know. Even today, you can have the media, you mention Christianity, and they'll snicker. Many of them will snicker. And how many Christians are man or woman enough to stand up when somebody insults God by not paying attention in one of his lectures? 
How many of you are that stupid? Think about it a moment. Or do you disrupt? God's word is a very serious thing. There are Christians that do stand for something rather than playing church. When we're studying God's word, let's pay attention to it. Now, that kind of covers education. What was one of the other subjects? Well, political. Now, we have probably one of the sh most shining examples uh, through politics in this generation uh, that you could want to come by. You know, I can remember when I was a young person, if someone in a political office were rude enough to let their personal life play in the higher offices of the land, they wouldn't have been around long. But the media today, it's all right. And I'm going to tell you what, I don't know how many of you have listened to the so-called trials, political trials, and you see one side that absolutely tries to shoot the messenger rather than the message the messenger's bringing, the facts, the data. In other words, they want to turn upon the law and say it's bad. Now that's, that's kind of serious stuff. But what did God tell you would come to pass? Revelation chapter 17 concerning horns. <clears throat> now, what has happened here in this 17th chapter is naturally the false Christ has been identified as the son of perdition. And then as much as perdition in the Greek tongue means one that has already been sentenced to perish, there's only one person that that has happened to. Do you know who it is or are you biblically illiterate? You know, there's already been a trial for him. It's, it's written and recorded in Ezekiel chapter 28. It's the son of perdition, which is to say Satan. The word perdition means to perish. He's already been judged to death. But he has some people he's leading. And they're a political organization. Incidentally, do you know what a dynasty is? A dynasty is a rule that one family holds for a long period of time or a short period of time. Same family. And this is why I have no problem calling these the hidden dynasties because it has been Satan's family or God's family from day one. <clears throat> so, know who the chief captain is here, the son of perdition. And again, there's no multiple choice because there's only one for someone that's biblically literate. Verse 12 reads in chapter 17, the book of Revelation. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Meaning what? It's political. Now a lot of people will draw weird pictures from chapter 13 about some grotesque month. No, it's a political system. Which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. That is the one hour that is the same equivalent of the five-month period spoken of in Revelation chapter 9. Some of you, as it is written in Mark 13, will be delivered up. To what? To witness or to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you when that day comes. I don't know. Do you have a destiny? Is there more to God's Word than you've been taught? Have you ever thought about that? Well, I don't know. That's up to you. doesn't matter to me. Verse 13. These have one mind. In other words, their mindset. You got it? They are well trained. They only think in one light. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. In other words, what beast? The religious beast. And I'll document that in a few minutes. 14. 
These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Who has the victory? Stay on the winning side. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I don't know, are you called? Or do you just float around? I don't know, God does that, man doesn't. 15. And he said unto me, the waters, in other words, this is the waters that that old beast rose from, that old political system. What were those waters? The waters which thou sawest, which the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In other words, that multi-headed monster that rose from the sea simply means it was a political system that rose from the peoples of the world. You have a leaning toward that today politically that is very interesting. You have mergers, 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 mergers. And I have already received a printout of the exchange rate between the euro dollar starting in January with what the American dollar is going to be. Now, what does that mean? Really, not a whole lot of anything other than when you see Chrysler join with a foreign country, when you see the Asian flu hit our stock market, then you realize the markets are already connected, friend. You're a lot closer to that than you might think. All right, verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Do you know what she's a prostitute of? I said, do you know what she's a prostitute of? Religion? Because a lot of people will sell themselves for an easy way out. 17. For God hath put in their hearts, that's the political system, to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom and to the beast, that's the son of perdition, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Whose word? My word? Your word? Uh-uh. Exactly the way it's written, that's the way it shall be fulfilled. 18, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. In other words, the woman herself, or the church system, so to speak, the religious system of all religions, all told, that are deceived and follow the false one, are Babylon. What does the word Babylon mean? Uh, let me think. It comes from the prime Babel, which means confusion. Do you remember the scripture? Father, our God is not the author of what? Confusion, but of peace. So be very careful when things seem confused to you. You haven't really studied the word to the point that you have clarity of understanding for yourself. And don't you listen to this man or any other man until you get back to the scriptures and dig it out for yourself whereby you are at peace and comfortable with it, with what the Father says. So there you kind of have the political. That's one of his methods. I need not point to you at how he has utilized politicians today. We've got some good ones, and we've got some that I'm going to tell you what, they're not much. <clears throat> and might, many might say, well, I wouldn't talk against them. No, no, let's get down to reality. Which ones would you like for your children to pattern as their example? Hmm? Do you proud? Which one of them would you like to be like? Think about it. Satan's doing a real good job. And I happen to know that one of these people sit in a church that taught God's word. Evidently, they didn't pay any attention. Know why? They were too busy, little minds that race and never quite take God's word serious. One of them came from this state. That's why I know the pastor that this person sit under. He knew better. Okay, 
What is the other dynasty then? The economy. And as I stated, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know, as I forestated, when we had Asian flu, in other words, when Japan's system failed because they had so many bad loans on the book that couldn't possibly be paid. Do you know who backed a lot of those? Your banks. Let's take Mexico. Do you know who loaned Mexico all that money that they kind of went under for? A lot of your banks. So when, um, when our government had to come up with $40 billion to bail out Mexico, where do you think that $40 billion ultimately uh, went to? It went to pay our banks off. Otherwise, you would have had a lot of bank failures and have been concerned. But you don't have to worry. That's not going to happen. But at least be wise enough to see what the world economy is doing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure the mergers, mergers, mergers. Doesn't that make you wonder sometimes? What's happening? Oh, well, just as long as I get my paycheck and I can get my post hosties every morning, I'll be all right. Well, I wonder. Okay. So, how, first of all, how was Antichrist to come into power? That probably would give us a pretty good idea. So again, we have a book that is just full of prophecies called the book of Daniel again. Uh, El is my Yah. El is, God, El is my God, meaning that, that's me, being the meaning of the word Daniel. Let's go to the book of Daniel and think about the economy in a sense. That, let's understand how the little horn is coming into power. That should give you a pretty good idea, shouldn't it? You know, you think about that a little bit. Daniel chapter 8. It would have been chapter 7 that that little horn would have come up among the ten. And um, uh, you'll, you'll find that in verses 7 and 8 of the 7th chapter. But I want your attention turned to chapter 8 on how the false one comes into power. Where does he get the umph, the power? Uh, let's go with uh, verse 23 so that we know an uh, identifier of time, dispensations. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of furious countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't have to define dark sentences for you. You know that's satanic sayings from the Hebrew. Verse 24. And his power, here we go, shall be mighty, but not by his own power. In other words, it's a false godhead. All right? And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper, meaning he's got the bucks, all right? And practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy land, meaning destroy it in what way? It's the great apostasy, where people are deceived where that same political system comes to power for that five-month period um, related in Revelation 9, verse 25. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He can cause anything he wants. You know, he's going to want to pay off your bills, number one. What, how will that suit you, all right? Want to get your bills all paid off, you know, and buy you maybe a new car or something? He can handle it. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Why peace? Well, I always heard it was going to be war. Uh-uh. It's not what the Bible says. He comes in peacefully claiming to be Jesus. And you know what? By the miracles he performs, many people that are biblically illiterate are going to be sucked in by it. That's why the horror was the waters, the people of the world that we just completed, if you were listening. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Why? Christ is going to do it. And the vision of the evening and the morning, 
which was told is true, whereof shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Well, you're coming to that time. Now turn on with me to the, the uh, chapter 11 of this same book. And we're going to go to the point where the vile person comes in. It was the same one we were reading of. Uh, let, let me ask you a question just so, you know, many of you might say, well, what does this have to do with Christianity? Well, when was the daily oblation we just read of done away with? There used to be a burnt offering every day. It was when Christ was crucified. So naturally it has to do with you. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 21 of chapter 11. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, claiming to be Jesus returned. Hey, that'll get him somewhere when he can perform miracles. 22, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflowing from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. In other words, Christianity will suffer at this time. Why? Because it's the time of the great apostasy when the majority, unfortunately, many Christians will be deceived by this joker. Why? They haven't studied God's Word, gone to church a lot, and they're pew potatoes, maybe not handed down the truth. That's no excuse. What have you personally done? That's what's important. Let me tell you something. They're good teachers in every denomination. Every denomination. It's according to what is being taught, whether it's God's Word or man's traditions. Verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. This word in the Hebrew is goy or goyim. 24, he shall enter peacefully. Now listen closely. This is his M.O. Even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and riches. Got any bills you need paid, if you will believe? Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Five-month period. I don't know, can you handle that? You know, one of his first little methods, and we'll read one more verse and we'll leave this. Verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. In other words, when someone makes light of teaching God's word, Satan will, correct, will boast about them with flatteries. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Do you know your Father? This is the living word. That's the way you absorb it. I'm proud of each and every one of you that you make a personal study, that you don't listen to this man or any other man without checking him out in the word of God. How does Satan come in? Peacefully and prosperously and divides the spoil among those that will receive him. Hey, you know, that's pretty difficult to fight against if people are biblically illiterate, whereby they will accept him when he performs miracles, which brings us to the last of the four religious horns. There's only one place you need to go for that, and that's Revelation chapter 13. The first 13 verses of the 13th chapter, I'm sorry, the first uh, 10 verses of Revelation chapter 13 have to do with that political system we were read of in chapter 17 of Revelation. But now we're going to let the word interpret itself when we put this much time into this. Verse 11 and I want you to figure this out for yourself. How sharp are you? And I beheld another beast. This is one that rises up after the political system. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Okay, what does it mean? 
what are horns? They're external. On the outside, he looks like the lamb slain. He looks like the lamb of God. But what is his voice? It's the voice of the dragon, which is what? Well, if you've ever read Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says that old dragon, which is the serpent, which is the devil. Right? He fills many roles. So he looks like the Lord Jesus Christ, but he is antichrist. Anti in the Greek tongue means instead of. Instead of Christ, he returns first saying, I've come to take a load of you out or you want to go with me. That's why you want to be pretty sharp in your father's word. You might jump in the wrong bus. You might jump right in bed with Satan rather than remaining a virgin for the true Christ. That's why Jesus would say in Mark 13, Woe to you that are with child when I return. Jesus likes to talk right down where the rubber meets the road, meaning what? He's been away for 2,000 years. If he comes back and finds you with a young suckling child, what does that mean? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it. You were untrue, unfaithful. He wasn't speaking of a mother carrying a child in a womb. That's a blessing. He's talking about those that are impregnated in their mind with lies and falsehoods and fall off to the first Messiah rather than waiting for the, sec the true Messiah to return. They don't know the difference. Why? Do you know what he's able to do? In other words, you've got a wolf in sheep's clothing here. He looks like the lamb, but this is the kind of religion it is. Verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast, that's the political, before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. 13, listen carefully. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of. That means visibly, in the sight of men. Do you know what this word is in the, in the Greek? He can snap his fingers and make lightning come down. Do you think that'll be effective? Hey, we got people that'll go bananas over rock stars. You let a dude like this come along saying he's Christ, snap his fingers and pure, come from the heavens, he's going to make a few points, friend. You want to be real careful, he might even deceive you. I don't think so. <clears throat> 14. Excuse me. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the political system, the beast, a government, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Live why? Because he shows up on the scene claiming to be Christ and the world follows him, thinking he's Christ or he's whatever religion they service, uh, study. He's their main man, all right? And I I'm, I'm choose to not mention any religions because I will never speak bad of a religion, a denomination, or anything else because there's good ones and bad ones among all the names and so forth. It's according to what kind of teacher they've got. Fifteen. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That means a spiritual death for those that really are not familiar with our Father's word. Why wouldn't he have power? He controls the economy, politics, education, and so forth. All right? Religion. 16, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their, in their foreheads. Now, you've heard preachers all your life say, don't let them stamp that 666 on you. Now, now you can read, you're intelligent. Did it say on or in? It said in the forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. That's what he's interested in stamping is your thought process. Many people today are deceived, and that's part of that deception. They don't even know it. They're not aware of it. Well, what about the hand? That means doing his work. And I'm going to tell you something. There are many people of many religions furthering his political, religious, and the economy without really being aware of it. Does that make them bad people? No but it might make them biblically illiterate. 
I don't know. I'm not judging them. I don't judge anyone, all right? But you hear the truth. This is your Father's Word, and then you make your own mind up, and it's fine with me, all right? Naturally, as, it, as Jesus said in Mark 13 about what are those that are with child and they give suck, giving suck means to nurse along Satan's work. Here, the right hand means your right hand is always symbolic of your power, all right? So it means doing his work for him. 17, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, which simply means that you would worship or be deceived by him. Here is wisdom, and truly it is in verse 18. Listen carefully. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Now let me tell you something. If I can have your attention away from that verse just one second. If you ever did yourself a favor, take that word count. Go to your Strong's Concordance and check it out in the Greek and find out what he really said there. It's not like we count when t t out. It is a Greek word that means count the stones worn smooth over a long period of time, the family of the deception, the dynasties. Do yourself a favor. And if you wouldn't do it for any other reason, do it to prove me wrong. All right. That's how you count, though, all right? <coughs> count what has happened over a long period of time. Four, it is the number of a man. A man that is coming. Don't forget this. What does the word Gabriel mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means man of God. Though he is an angel, he's still a man. Satan in Isaiah 14 is called an Ish in the Hebrew, which is a man also. The man of sin. It is the number of a man. How do you know him? And his number is 600, three score, and six. And I'm simply going to say six, six, Six. Now let me ask you something. What happens in the sixth seal? Oh, let me see. Well, the Antichrist comes. Yep. What happens at the sixth trump? Um, the Antichrist appears. What happens at the sixth vial? Antichrist appears. Beloved, the seals are not given in chronological order, but are given whereby you could best gain understanding of events that would transpire. But both the seals and the trumps and the vials come together at 666, showing you when Satan is cast to the earth as the spurious Messiah. And check the word count out. It means to enumerate by stones, like casting lots, only not casting. You know because of, you have the key of David that opens locks that no one can close. Meaning what? You have the truth concerning the true Messiah. So there we have the four hidden dynasties. That pretty well wraps it up. Interesting study. It can be thought of as uh, perhaps... Maybe um, a, a little bit boring, but at the same time, let's just, in closing, go back to the Hebrew children in our mind for a moment, those that were called out to be specially taught. Do you think it drew them away from their true father? And I'm going to mention Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No. When they tried to get them to worship the 606, every time six instruments were sounded, you know, pretty soon a wise person says, God's trying to tell me something. This is six, six, you know, just all. They wouldn't bow. Even after they'd been trained that three years, they didn't pull away from God. Why? They set an example for you. They were cast into the fiery furnace he did seven times, and Nebuchadnezzar himself saw the Son of God walking with them. You know what? They weren't singed. Why? God's not mad at you. When his wrath spills over on the world, you don't have to worry about being gone in his tribulation. Do you give God not enough credit that he's able to punish his enemies without punishing those he loves? I'm glad I worship the God I worship rather than the one you do, if that's your case, because he protected those three children. <coughs> Excuse me, in that furnace. 
And it's simply to say, what is God? God is a consuming fire. Last verse of the 12th chapter of Hebrews, also written in the Old Testament. God is a consuming fire. That's the Holy Spirit that touches you and warms you and touches your mind and it clicks. You say, wow, that's interesting. His word is interesting. So I would only close with one parting thought. Horns are external. If you look, you can see them. Do you care about looking? I would advise you to. Keep your eyes open, especially in this generation of the fig tree. A lot of interesting things going to happen. So be aware. Four hidden dynasties. Do you have to be afraid of them? Of course not. But at least be aware. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the written word. We thank you for giving us understanding in that word. We pray for more understanding, for we know no one knows everything except thee, thine self, Father, thyself, Father. Gain us that knowledge. We ask it in pre the precious name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus.